Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for Before They Were Native, a brief, stress the word brief, brief history of the flora of Florida, our flowery state. My name is James Stevenson. I am with the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, a department within Pinellas County uh, and the state of Florida. So we work hand in hand to bring research-based information to our citizens here uh, to help make decisions uh, and to hopefully foster a love for our natural areas uh, and encourage people to take part in conservation efforts in their own lives. So today's topic before they were native, a brief history. Uh, if you read the description of today's presentation, um, the objective is to look at the snapshot that we have just right now of our native plants. And how did we get to this moment? We've all been pretty well versed in what's, what perils, what imperils our native flora. And many people attempt to use native plants in order to conserve them in order to conserve all the other organisms that depend on our native plants. But to zoom out a little bit, let's just figure out what it means. How did we get where we are? So when we're talking about native flora, native plants, native plant gardening, um, what is native? What does native mean to you? And it, is perhaps something that you never thought of. Uh, just something that has naturally occurred in Florida, naturally. Um, since when? Um, or, you know, you see where I'm going? What is it that triggers the feeling of a native plant to you? The Florida Native Plant Society, an institution devoted to the study, preservation, cultivation, and education about native plants, they have their own definition that a committee of um, very well-versed individuals came together and memorialized. And the Florida Native Plant Society refers to a species um, that occurred within state boundaries prior to European contact. Uh, based on, you know, the best evidence that we have of what existed there. Prior to the Europeans arriving with the understanding that after the Europeans arrived, a whole lot of changes happened that very much disrupted the species distribution and diversity and densities in different areas as a direct result of the arrival of the Europeans. So that's the Florida Native Plant Society. And that's, you know, very well put, very succinct. The US Department of Agriculture, who of course, has a very different um, set of rules, uh, agenda, if you want to use that word, the US Department of Agriculture also has a reason to define native plants. But with their own set of uh, rules and regulations and the things that the US Department of Agriculture is responsible for, their definition of a native plant um, is, a, is much more relaxed, shall we say. And even in the definition, in the very first sentence of the USDA's definition of a native plant, they admit it's difficult to define. And, you know, a state is an arbitrary circumscription, um, subjective, really. Um, talking about native plants as opposed to plants that have been introduced from another part of the world, which might put in your mind the other side of the world, but 
really Georgia is another part of the world if we're going to use state boundaries. And the USDA also makes the point that people have been moving plants around as long as there have been people. And we'll look at that a little bit more a little bit later. To make things even woollier, um, the USDA um, defines native as far as native to the lower 48 states you'll see in this list. So certain jurisdictions include Alaska, Canada separate, the lower 48 for the rest, and nativity to the USDA. They will go out on a limb and confer native status on some species, probably native on other species, uh, some species that are merely persistent after having been brought into cultivation, uh, and so on. So much more loosey-goosey, as it were. But that's per the USDA's quote-unquote agenda. Uh, UF IFAS, the organization that, the umbrella organization that we kind of operate under, here at Brooker Creek Preserve, a preserve of native plant and animal species in Pinellas County. Um, the, U the UF IFAS has recently published a paper about um, native species and where they are found geographically, how they compare to non-native species, and what vocabulary we actually should be using as professionals and eventually as the average pe person on the street, the lay people, uh, when we're discussing the issue of nativity and non-nativity. And what's interesting in this is they'll use the example of the coyote and you know how are we gonna define the species that has arrived in living memory and established itself. Is it now a native species? It wasn't here before European contact, but now it is here. So UF has introduced in this paper, the standardized invasive species terminology, uh, the concept of range change over time. And today's presentation, we're talking about an awful lot of time, a lot more time than my little brain can even comprehend. Um, and the amount of time since European arrival in the Southeast US is really just a blip. And what constitutes native in this very second today on this peninsula with a little bit of panhandle is of course very different than it was in these stretches of time that have been involved in the movement of plants and even continents around the world so you ask the average person what do the plants look like in florida you say, picture Florida, picture the plants in Florida. Undoubtedly, they're gonna picture palm trees on a beach. And most likely, uh, at least two, perhaps three, non-native palm species, the coconut palm or the Washingtonia palm, very iconic. Uh, they're all souvenir quality imagery. Uh, they're kind of everywhere. You picture Florida, you picture these. But what we actually have as a native flora in Florida are plant communities, which are more often than not defined by the dominant plant species found in that community. For instance, the oak hammock is a dominant plant community, a dominant ecosystem in the native flora of Florida, named after, of course, the upper story, uh, the canopy species being composed mainly of the larger oak 
species. Pine flatwoods, another ecosystem defined by the dominant species pine, longleaf or slash pine, in some cases sand pine, and the, all the associated plants that are also found in that habitat. A swamp, a hardwood swamp, is a flooded forest of hardwood trees. Species include Tupelo and Sweet Bay and other denizens, red maples, things like this, things that are found in flooded forest, plants that have adapted to those ecosystems and defined them. And of course, the iconic cypress domes, uh, which are literally dome shaped, usually uh, plants that have filled in where sinkholes have opened up. And those plants that are the best suited to outcompete anything else that might try and be growing there include the cypress. Uh, several different varieties of a species of cypress or two species, two separate species of cypress, depending on how you want to slice it. Mangrove swamp are coastal habitats dominated by, guess what, these plants that are called mangroves that have the adaptations that are suited to thrive and be the dominant vegetation in our estuarine, brackish areas along the coast. That's just Pinellas County. Those habitats are just the ones that we have here in Pinellas County. And there are a couple of others that are found here and there in little pockets. Our county is an urban county. Our county is built out. Our, our county has hardly any native plants and animals, remnant populations of populations that had been here prior to European contact prior to European arrival. So how can we say that anything in Pinellas County is a native plant? Even if we bring native plants into our own landscape, native plants into our own landscape, it's highly likely that they were grown in another part of the world, even if that other part of the world is just citra in North Florida. Do you see what I'm saying? The concept of nativity and moving plants around, it, it's, a, it's a mind stretch to get our head around and really, you know, settle things in your brain so that, you know, if you choose to care about these things, you're approaching them with as open a mind as possible. So let's look, now that we've seen some of the landscape types, some of the ecosystems, plant communities, what are the factors that lead to the establishment of plant communities writ large? What natural factors? In other words, what makes ecosystems? What natural forces make ecosystems? Well, the physical location on the planet plays an enormous role. So, our physical location between the latitude of 30 north and the Tropic of Cancer positions Peninsular Florida in a space, in space, that can define what plant communities are even capable of establishing themselves. So our physical location. Also, the physical shape of our state. We are a long peninsula. There is the ability of, of plants over time to move north and south, but not very much side to side. If environmental forces were pressuring our state flora east or west, um, should anything like this happen, uh, there's really not much give there. Whereas north and south, there's plenty of room until you reach the tip of Florida. And we'll talk about what happens then in a little bit. So physical location on earth, 
the temperature regimes of a particular place on a particular continent determined by winter temperatures when of course our planet tilts a little bit further away from the sun and things get cold it's about to happen fingers crossed uh, there is a cold hardiness map which was really uh, con not necessarily conceived of, but embraced by the horticultural community, the agricultural community. Um, it is a record of the average low temperatures in North America, all over the world, but we're considering the U.S. cold hardiness map. And zones are defined based on the average low temperature, the cold hardiness. Certain plants cannot exist or thrive or at least live long enough to reproduce outside of their cold tolerance. And so agricultural crops wouldn't be grown outside of their cold temperate if, if this is a, a crop that you mean to produce year after year. Um, Add to that, becoming more and more important, and we're seeing evidence of this every single day. Scientists have been seeing evidence of this for decades, but now it's actually reaching, you know, mainstream headlines. Heat hardiness is becoming more and more of an issue. And to be honest, this heat hardiness zone map is a relatively new construct. It's only about 20 years old, and it's already out of date. Um, average number of days above 86 degrees. This map was this map that you're looking at right now was created about 10 years ago, and it's woefully out of date. This really needs to be updated. So heat is going to become even more of an issue. So agricultural plants, horticultural plants that cannot tolerate heat are going to have to be grown in higher latitudes. Native vegetation that cannot tolerate certain levels of heat will stop being able to reproduce in more southerly latitudes and will begin to be found in more northerly latitudes naturally. There will be a natural migration of plant communities, species by species, northward as these plants reach the limits of their heat tolerance. Soil types, another abiotic factor, heat, latitude, cold, these are abiotic factors. These have nothing to do with with biology, biological forces. Soil types, another. How did the substrate end up where it is? Well, here we have a breakdown of the different types of substrate that we call soils that have settled through various methods of even arriving on our peninsula or to our peninsula or through our, our peninsula and established themselves into these various soil types. Soil type can play a large role in establishing different plant communities. Water drainage, we've heard of watersheds, the way that water moves through a particular area. So again, those plants that are better adapted to living in flooded forests are going to be found in the wetter areas. And we have plants that are better adapted to living in extremely dry where water is much more of a limiting factor. So, water, temperature, all these things, they lead to the establishment of these plant communities, and they have done. And we have, in human memory, existed alongside of and within and despite these plant communities that have established themselves and all the species therein perfectly adapted to living with all of those abiotic forces. We talked about how then 
plants are going to escape? How are they going to move? How are they going to migrate? How have they migrated? How have plants found themselves in these associations? A lot of that has to do with their mobility. Plants are a lot more mobile than we give them credit for. Plants' reproductive structures are either seeds, which can be transported through various mechanisms, the wind, animals, water. Seeds are meant to be transported away from the parent plant. So plants have a relatively quick life cycle, can produce lots and lots of propagules, be they seeds or be they spores, and those can travel great distances and will eventually find just the right place. So that is how plants can move. So how did we get to be right where we are in this very second, in this very snapshot of these native plant communities? Well, let's go on a really fast 500 million year journey into our present native plant communities. Bear with me. Okay, phase one, the movement of land itself on the surface of Earth. Y'all, we're gonna start there, plate tectonics. We now know through experimental proof that our planet has this rocky crust that is buoyant, that is floating on molten rock, and it is floating and drifting and expanding and contracting and subsiding and erupting and volcanic and doing all the things, drifting around. And a, a 500 million year time lapse would show these plates, which are outlined here, drifting around based on the activity of the um, subduction and the eruption events along the borders of these plates. So the plates move around and currently the plates are situated just like this. The various plates which have names and boundaries, they're discernible, these boundaries, are situated just like this. But it's not how things started out. As Earth, as a planet, was sorting itself out and the plates and the crust were forming and moving and changing, we have evidence, very good evidence, of various land masses that have been given historical names. One of these land masses, which should be near and dear to us in Florida, is a land mass called Gondwana or Gondwana land, but it's short for Gondwana. Gondwana is short for Gondwana land. Composed of the continents of Australia, Antarctica, India, Arabia, Africa, and South America, and Florida, y'all. So very, very old, squished together plates begin to drift and pull and sail. And our Florida is here being very much and sharing the bedrock of Northwest Africa. So our little peninsula started off with its big brothers and sisters, South America, Africa, before drifting across the water, across the surface of the earth, and during this time of continental drift, 
plants were coming up on land, this uncharted territory. Plant life, photosynthesis had all been going on. Our atmosphere was pretty well established and plant life was moving from being seaweed effectively to becoming land plants. And some representatives of those very early land plants still exist today in the form of a group of plants called the bryophytes, better known to us as the mosses, not the stuff that hangs in the trees. That's, that's a, an unfortunate common name, but the true mosses, the little green fuzz that shows up in between bricks, underneath downspouts, generally in cool kind of shady areas. Um, these are the very first plants to get up on land. They had just enough ability to prevent from being completely dried out. They have a little cuticle, a little waterproof coating. Um, they don't have any vascular systems. They, they can't move water around. They're still dependent on fresh water in the form of rain to move their reproductive structures around. But all these, all these ingredients were, were already in place when the earliest of the mosses were developing and encroaching and began to spread and diversify on land, becoming some of the first land plants that are still around today, modern species of moss. As land became more and more hospitable, due no, in no small part to the presence of these early land plants like the mosses, we a group of plants that are known as the ferns developed. These are plants with vascular systems. They can reach a little bit higher, still using spores to reproduce, which was an effective way of reprodu reproducing underwater, works just as well on land. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And land continues to be colonized by these first land plants. As they die, their carbonate, carbohydrate rich bodies are just piling up, piling up on land. As the moss dies, as the ferns die, the liverworts, all kinds of wonderful non-vascular plants, they're just dying on land and building up, building up, and so on. Meanwhile, Gondwana is traipsing across the surface of the earth and it runs into another land mass called Laurentia. It's up here, Laurentia. And when Gondwana bumps into Laurentia, raising the Blue Ridge Mountains, it delivers Florida to the southeast, what will become US. And this land mass is now called Pangaea. You can see that we're kind of looking at things from below. Here's the South Pole. So looking kind of northward, um, you can kind of get an orientation of how these land masses were orientated. Plants were thriving during this time. They were traipsing all across these continents. Plants were getting so big that they were forming individuals that we would call trees, 50 meters tall, lignified tissues, woody, substantial, had all the room they needed, had all the sunlight, hardly any competition for anything, throwing spores, eventually throwing seeds, to reproduce and cover this land mass. But their bodies on death were still piling up. There were still no microorganisms that could decay all of this plant material very quickly or very efficiently. And we are entering into this period called the Carboniferous, because all of that undecayed 
plant material, all those trees and ferns and everything else, were just piling up and piling up and piling up and not decaying. And eventually becoming buried and with pressure and time becoming coal, becoming petroleum, becoming all these, all this photosynthate that's trapped underground that we're now taking out and releasing that sun energy in the form of combustible fuels. So on land, the large plants continue to grow and thrive and die. And this is going on for millions of years. And the types of plants that you're finding include Lepidodendron, one of the larger of these carboniferous tree-like structures, and Sigillaria. These belong to a group of plants that still exist today, although very, very diminished in stature. Today, we have the little lycopods like such as Lycopodiella, the club mosses. These are quote unquote primitive. Um, they're modern species of a lineage that used to include the dominant trees on land. And today we find them as very diminutive, small little creepy things, no real leaves, just creeping photosynthetic stems and every once in a while sticking up cones to release spores to reproduce themselves. This is a picture of some Lycopodiella taken here at Burger Creek. All that's left of this great lineage. Another of the tree-like plants, a group called the Sphenopsids, like Calamites, another one of the major contributors to our petroleum products today. Huge trees, today represented by all that's left, the little scouring rushes. You might be familiar with scouring rush. You might be familiar with equisetum. It's a type of fern, and it has the special quality of having glass silica in its cell walls. It can take silica out of the environment and incorporate it into its cell walls, uh, which humans discovered made excellent Brillo pads, which is how it gets its name, the scouring rush. Um, hollow stems like a rush, but it's actually a fern. Picture on the right with a human-ish hand for scale is the little cone that it produces its spores in. So kind of the pointy end of a grand history of life plant life on earth has come to a point with all that's left of this group, the little scouring rushes, the equisetums. As plants were becoming more and more sophisticated, shall we say, and developing more um, efficient reproductive me mechanisms, we come across, we discover a group that are the conifers. And this is the first group of plants that have figured out how to create a seed. Well, it's not the first group, but it's a group that was extremely successful in creating seeds and is still around today, the conifers. And we're all familiar with conifers in Pinellas County, represented by three species of pines. Not a huge diversity, easy to learn. If you'd like to learn the pines of Pinellas and how to tell them apart, you can check out a whole um, 40 minutes on the pines of Pinellas hosted by Lara, our natural resources educator here, our agent of natural resource education here in Pinellas County. The ferns, meanwhile, continued to develop, diversify, dominate. They had a good thing going. They have a rapid life cycle, efficient life cycle, still dependent on rainwater to, to take care of their uh, reproductive process, but there was plenty of that. And of course, there's plenty of modern species of ferns. That's a lifestyle, uh, a body plan, a reproductive method. What makes a fern a fern is all those things still around today, 
still diversifying, and we have plenty of modern species of ferns. More about ferns, another YouTube video. This one lasts a little bit longer, and we go through a list of the native ferns of Pinellas. Again, check us out on YouTube. Now, meanwhile, we've had Gondwana bump into Laurasia. We've got the Blue Ridge squishing up. The earth is heating and cooling, heating, cooling, heating, cooling. We're having uh, cooling events where ice, fresh water is being locked up in the ice caps in both the North and South Pole, drawing all the seawater away from the coast and making coastlines incredibly huge. And then warm periods when all that ice melts, flooding the coastlines. So during this era called the Pennsylvanian, our little bit of Florida, our former piece of Africa, which is now firmly stuck to this North American continent, is completely underwater. So we don't have to worry about any of the native plants of Florida during this time because Florida is underwater. I mean, maybe some eelgrass, right? If it's shallow enough for eelgrass. But this is kind of an outline completely underwater. These areas are swampy. The rest are kind of uh, a shallow sea that ran through the most of North America. Very, very wet, very, very hot. Sea level is very high. Around this time, not in North America, but more likely in, in China, the flowering plants were sorting their business out. And there's some very new, very recent publications on some of the very first of the flowering plants. Fascinating stuff. And we can talk all about that in a presentation called A Natural History of the Flower. But for now, we've got good evidence that the first flowering plants were aquatic uh, in these freshwater swamp areas where it's really hot. The reason that we have this is because of some of the morphological evidence and the fact that there's fish fossils found with them. Really cool stuff. So we've got our plate tectonics now figured out. And as all these plates were scooting around and finishing up where they basically are now with plants crawling all over them, um, we enter phase two, which is all that more capacity building up all that carbon, all that coal, sorry, carbonate building, which is limestone, not carboniferous, but the carbonate, excuse me about that. Anyway, so here we are, our little piece of Africa, which is referred to as the Florida platform, uh, sitting in this shallow sea. There is a current running from west to east across what is basically now the panhandle of Florida, which is washing everything north of that area away from peninsular Florida. What's happening in the rest of the southeast U.S is those Blue Ridge Mountains are weathering. They were peaks higher than the Grand Peaks. What are they called? Rocky Mountains. And now they're weathering away. And all that acidic granite is leaching and running southward. But thankfully, the seaway is preventing any of that acid from finding its way to the carbonate platform of Florida where corals are growing, where diatoms are forming, where microscopic shelled organisms, animals are at work, animals that can take calcium and carbon out of the water and make limestone, basically. They can make the, their seashells, their coral tests, um, and so on. And all these organisms are now living and dying and their exoskeletons and coral reefs are building and building and building and we're becoming a very limestone rich 
platform. Florida is lining up, building, 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 all these layers of carbonate underwater. This is all happening underwater. All of those ferns and all that conifers, horsetail business, they moved out while all this is happening to our platform. The carbonate is building up. Sea levels, again, are going to increase and decrease. Sea level rise is going to flood the state. Um, as the ice caps melt, when we have a cooling period, the coastline is going to go much further out. And this is happening over and over and over again as when Florida is underwater, that carbonate is building up. Now, the aftermath of all that carbonate building up is led to the creation of our aquifer, the Floridan aquifer, which is limestone. Limestone is very porous due to the action of acidic intrusion, and it holds water very efficiently like a sponge. And it's where a certain significant amount of our fresh drinking water comes from, this area called the Floridan Aquifer, the result of the carbonate, carbonate buildup. So about 70 million years ago, we have a final breakup of some of the components of Gondwana, original Gondwana. Australia, Antarctica, and South America, who had been all nice and strung together, come apart. And this led to a circular current, ocean current, around Antarctica. And for various meteorological and physical reasons, that made things get really, really cold. And we stopped having our warm, wet period of Earth, and we, came, we became cold Earth, very cold. Ice forming and taking up water into the poles, and sea level disappearing for miles, and the exposure of the platform of Florida for a significant period of time, becoming exposed land. That channel of acid washing away water that shuts down and all the acid begins to come down from the north and it's going to begin its effect on our limestone. That acid comes in the form of weathered rock. Weathered rock can be called sand. This is when Florida became the sandy spit that we are, a major sand building event or the siliclastic event, sand arriving from up north as the Blue Ridge Mountains weathered away. Sea level rising, falling, rising, falling. Sand, sea level, the highest points in Florida were formed during this period. The ridge, the Lake Wales Ridge. As sea level rose and the action of waves and the surf came in from east and west, this ridge of raised sandbar established right down the center of the state and remains the highest points in Florida. When sea level became even higher, that ridge became a string of islands. 
So periodically, islands were all that was left of peninsular Florida running right down the center. At other times, sea level would be miles and miles out. The plants are moving ahead of all of these changes. Of course, these changes happen over centuries and centuries. And plants, thanks to their mobile seeds, can send their offspring ahead of these events. So as the sea encroaches naturally on land, the individual plants are going to perish because they're not suited to that ecosystem. Their ecosystem is changing because of the abiotic forces, but their offspring have been planted, quote unquote, further afield and can establish there. And this goes on for centuries and centuries. So plant communities are able to adapt to all these changes. Meanwhile, what else is going to be coming down as the sand infiltrates into Florida? As the sand comes, so do the animals. And as mentioned, so do the plants. As it gets colder, as the glaciers and ice caps move further south, the plant communities are going to run in front of those. Just like plant communities are going to retreat from encroaching sea level rise. So plant communities, entire communities, are drifting back and forth, north and south, east and west, due to these abiotic stresses, forces, completely natural. The plants are able to stay ahead of it. We are currently in an interglacial period. Things have been pretty stable in human memory that we can write down. And in human memory, the plant community writ large of the southeastern United States is referred to as the Eastern Coastal Plain Flora. Now, of course, within this large swathe, we have all those little communities that we discovered that we discussed just the Pinellas County versions, but overall, the flora is referred to as the Eastern Coastal Plain Flora. And this is the historic distribution of that flora. We have a good idea of plant distribution, species distribution for 60,000 years, thanks to the persistence of that Lake Wales Ridge that runs down the spine of Florida. We have 60,000 years worth of evidence of plant speciation in central Florida, thanks to the persistence of the Lake Wales Ridge and within the Lake Wales Ridge, the persistent of a particular lake, an ancient lake, Lake Tulane. And Lake Tulane collected a historical, historical debris. And going down to the bottom of the lake and taking a sample, a what's called a core sample, uh, basically putting a huge toilet paper roll down miles and lifting it back up, and then figuring out how long ago this particular section of the core was and, and analyzing what is in that section of the core, we've been able to discover what was growing around that lake for the past 60,000 years. A huge, density of the genus Pinus, the pines. The pines, of course, in Florida have wind pollination. We all know in the spring that 
pines release their pollen into the wind. There's no insect carrying their pollen. It just sends out clouds of pollen, hoping that that pollen will find a female cone and the pollen will fertilize the egg and a seed will form. But those clouds of pollen were also able to settle on the surface of the lake, eventually sinking to the bottom, giving us an idea of the species that were found around that time. Slash pine, longleaf pine, and sand pine. All three species in profusion right around that place around that time. The heat and the drought associated with the, the dry conditions associated with the sandy soil and the extreme heat, the fires that would have started thanks to the lightning, these factors then contributed to the overall composition of the plant communities at the time. And a group of plants arrived and then speciated or arrived fully capable to thrive in these conditions, the oaks. And we might think of we might have a mental image of what an oak leaf looks like if we're from the Northeast US. And moving here into Peninsular Florida, we don't see the same typical oak leaves that we're used to. We have different species, species that are more readily adapted to life in our sandy peninsula. Oaks, like pines, although not even remotely related, also depend on the wind for pollination. Again, in the spring, the oak trees need to get their pollen from one flower to another flower, and they do not use an insect to make that happen. They just throw all their pollen out into the wind. And these are the male flowers releasing pollen, hoping that the wind will take their pollen to the female flowers, these tiny little things. So the wind carrying the pollen to the female flowers, the wind also carrying the pollen across Lake Tulane, settling on the surface and sinking to the bottom, giving us a record of the species that were present for those 60,000 years. The female flowers, after being pollinated, of course, turn into the fruit, which we know is an acorn. Acorns being very uh, portable and through the action of animal activities, water activities, rushing down a river, getting caught up in a flood, um, a squirrel burying it and forgetting about it. This is how the plants are getting around um, and be, being planted. And we find evidence of species in the depths of Lake Tulane, the pollen of the live oak in particular. Now there's 26 species of oaks, um, perfectly suited for a dry climate, associated often with grasslands. Grasses are another group of flowering plants that use the wind to disperse their pollen. And the grass communities, the grassland, the savanna species, also very well preserved in the deposits in Lake Tulane. Oaks because of the fact that they are wind pollinated because they throw their pollen out into the air there's no insect moving pollen from one identical flower to another identical flower there is the chance of hybridization amongst oaks which is an excellent survival and adaptation um, coincidence being able to hybridize hybrids often confer a, uh, an edge, a, survive, a survival edge on their offspring. So oaks are still kind of sorting themselves out. Another plant with wind pollination syndrome, the ragweed, which we all know can irritate us when it releases its pollen into the air. Again, there's no insect moving these 
the pollen of this plant around. It's just throwing it out into the air and hoping for the best, also landing in the deposits and giving us an idea of the speciation of plants around at the time. So here come the people. Now, Peninsular Florida has been above water. Plant communities have established. Um, climate has become stable. Humans appear on the scene and discover plant communities that can be exploited. And we enter into the people time, the Holocene. And there is an editorial about how much we should consider, to what extent we should consider Native American migration and plant distribution as a direct response to that. What part do humans play in the establishment of native flora? Can that be determined? It's quite an interesting read. All these will be in the bibliography at the end. So all this time during all these geologic events, during the period that Florida was out of the water. Sometimes that period was very brief. Sometimes all Florida was was a chain of islands, the Lake Wales Ridge. During those times when there was nothing else around, on these islands or on these little isolated plant communities, species arose from ancestors who bestowed certain survival characteristics on their offspring, those offspring through generations and generations and generations eventually change into what could be considered an entirely new species, distinct from and not sexually compatible with the parent species anymore living in isolation for so long, speciating, becoming so uh, specialized for its own area that it becomes a new species. And there are 245 species of plant in Florida that are found nowhere else, endemics, as a result of some form of isolation event that led to the development of 245 different species of plants, grasses, ferns, flowering plants, all these things, 245 different ones. And we'll finish up today looking at what we can truly call native Florida plants. Florida, as it is a little chunk of Africa, that came across and squished into Laurentia all those many millions of years ago. Phase milkweed is one of these from very dry, sandy, scrubby areas. The Florida milkweed. This is a Florida endemic. You won't find this anywhere else. This is a very small gossamer winged butterfly. So you get an idea of the scale of this little milkweed. Its flowers are pure white and its leaves are very long and narrow, blending in very easily with the grasses that it's often associated with. Is this a host for the monarch butterfly? Not willingly. This is not a plant that produces a copious amount of leaves. It can't really quote unquote afford to lose much of its leaf growth. But if a monarch were to land on this flower and were to accidentally be laden with a bag of pollen to take to another flower, the flower, the species certainly wouldn't mind. But it is not the milkweed that is associated with the monarch butterfly. Just a native milkweed, 
minding its own business in the scrubby areas of the state. All of these species, as a matter of fact, can be found here at Brooker Creek, all of these endemics. This is a photograph of Florida green eyes taken here at Brooker Creek, Berlandiera. Of course, it's a, it's a little diminutive sunflower, one of a few Florida wildflowers that continues flowering for most of the year. Well, at least from spring until autumn. This is a plant that you can very often find in flower. And being a member of the sunflower family, you'll look closely that it's not just one flower. These are individual little tubular flowers, all each one waiting to be visited, each one capable of developing a single nice big fat seed um, to help reproduce the species. A relative of spiderwort or spider flower is the endemic Florida scrub rosling. Uh, this little three petaled flower melts in a single day. The flowers are most receptive to pollinators early in the morning. Those pollinators that like to get up before it gets too hot, uh, visit flowers before the nectar evaporates. Once that pollination event has happened, uh, the petals literally melt away. And again, this plant then resembles all the grasses that it is associated with. Those adaptations to life in sandy, dry soil, not a lot of leaf surface to evaporate lots of, lots of water. The pineland purple, also in the group that's often called the paintbrush, or um, what's another one, the sweet something or other, um, they used to roll them up in cigars, vanilla leaf, it's in that whole complex, uh, carfeferous odoratissimus, uh, the odor coming from the crushed leaves smelling of vanilla. Uh, this variety subtropicanus is only found in Florida. And this is the one that we have here at Burger Creek. Not, doesn't have the um, odoriferous leaves as much as the regular species does. Sand butterfly pea, a climbing vine in the, obviously in the pea family. There are a couple of different species of butterfly pea. This endemic, the sand butterfly pea, if it's important to you, can be told apart from the more typical butterfly pea by having these rather small calyx leaves, calyx lobes, we call them, the little, um, before the flower opens, the, the bud leaves that open to reveal the flower inside. If it's important to you, that's how you can tell them apart. It's an endemic, only found in Florida, obviously from a common ancestor with its cousin, the regular butterfly pea. A couple of species of uh, what are called rosemary, not the culinary rosemary, uh, but in the mint group of flowering plants that have the essential oils, very aromatic, very similar flower to rosemary, very similar leaf size, the adaptations to living in dry climates Rosemary, the culinary from the Mediterranean, where it's very dry, our native uh, Conradina, also in a very dry climate with those uh, needle-like leaves that don't lose much moisture. Lots of uh, oily leaves. Oil doesn't evaporate as readily as uh, just a, a juicy leaf might evaporate. The Florida tick seed, it's on our... Um, Florida Wildflower Foundation license plate. Get the license plate, support Florida wildflowers. Uh, this is an endemic, an endemic little, another little endemic daisy, uh, a tick seed named after the shape of its little seeds. We have a native anise tree. Yes, it's the same anise, same genus of anise that is used in culinary creations. This is not the commercially produced or harvested species. Our little yellow anise tree native to Florida, 
just kind of minds itself, minds its own business. The commercially produced species is an Asian species. Um, not to say that our native species could not be brought into cultivation and used as a crop. It just hasn't been. This one is just existing here and there um, with its little yellow kind of semi-transparent flowers. And of the oaks, the majestic oaks, spare a thought for the counterparts that came to Florida, figured out how to survive the heat and the fire and the sand by being pretty small, pretty, I hate to say insignificant because they're very significant in the ecosystems that they thrive in and support and contribute to. But from an outsider, staring at a vast expanse of scrubland, an outsider would see that as wasteland, much more suitable for putting houses on, much more suitable for putting orange groves on. It's one of the unfortunate side effects of our native flora is that it does not have in the Western artistic tradition does not have an new enormous amount of aesthetic value. So the downfall of our native Florida flora can lie in the very adaptations that allow the plants to grow here. Yeesh. Ending on that sour note, that's enough. That's enough for today. Um, 500 million years in just over an hour. Congratulations to you all for staying with us. I hope, you, I hope I'm not just talking to my empty computer screen. Um, if you do at this point have any questions, comments, complaints, suggestions, please use the Q&A. Drop your questions in there. Check us our recorded webinars on our YouTube channel. Um, all sorts of topics all across the board. Um, drop some questions in the Q&A. We have a poll that we would like you to take. So in just a few seconds, drop some questions, answer some questions, answer some poll questions. I'll take a drink and we'll answer some questions. If you could quickly on your phone or on your screen, just answer the uh, webinar, post webinar poll questions. Um, oh, when is the next in-person seminar? I will be, I personally will be at the East Lake Library this Saturday the 10th of September at 11 o'clock. If you're in the neighborhood, drop by the East Lake Library on East Lake Road. Uh, we're doing the magic of mushrooms. Um, after that, we'll be back here at Brooker Creek Preserve in October on October 15th. Again, the magic of mushrooms. And at this class on October 15th, you'll have the ability to purchase a mushroom growing kit, just perfect for Halloween. Um, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, up here has a great question. How is the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide affecting plant growth and speciation? Uh, Rick, I don't have first-hand knowledge of this, but I do know that the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is having a marked increase on certain species growth rate. Certain invasive species are showing to be increasing at faster rates due to a higher level of carbon dioxide. Not to say that native species can't also benefit, but 
native plant growth rate isn't as often as closely monitored as invasive species growth rates. Does that make sense? So the plants that we're, the very rare and the very invasive are generally the groups of plants that we have our eyes on the most. What is the reproductive rate of both of those? One we want to be more, one we want to be less. And there are lines being drawn between higher atmospheric CO2 and the advance of uh, invasive species. Great question, thank you. All right, well, I really appreciate your comments, questions, and we do hope to see you here at Brooker Creek just for a visit or to join us for Mushroom Magic in October on the 15th. But until we see you again, thanks again for joining us and do enjoy the rest of your day.